After hearing about the fundamentals of both material extrusion methods, FFF and FGF, and understanding what materials are available for both forms, we want to review some technical learnings that can shed some additional light on the technology and how to use it. Let's start with material handling. The filament used in FFF is produced in either 1.75 or 2.85 strand diameter and it's wound onto a spool. These spools are stored and loaded into the 3D printer. For FGF, the pellets are contained and dried in an industrial drying hopper, typically located outside the machine. The material is called upon from sensors within the machine and is conveyed through corrugated tubing into a smaller secondary hopper. Within both types of added manufacturing processes, Consideration of proper material storage and pre-processing procedures can help ensure effective results. Regardless if the material is in a form of pellet or filament strand, there's an importance of drying the polymer and keeping it dried throughout the duration of the printing. Polymers can either be hygroscopic or non-hygroscopic, each type having a set of characteristics that have a certain affinity to gather moisture. Materials like nylon, ABS, PET, and polycarbonate are hygroscopic and are actively seeking moisture to absorb internally. Materials like PVC, polypropylene, polystyrene, polyethylene, they're non-hygroscopic. These materials don't absorb moisture internally, but can collect moisture on the surface. Moisture plays a serious role in how the material will extrude and will perform once extruded. Moistures can affect the surface finish and cause discoloration, lower the mechanical properties, impacting the strength and the elongation of break, affecting the electrical properties, and even lower the viscosity. For some materials, it's, it's easy to notice the moisture as you will see excessive drilling from the barrel, bubbles on the surface of the extruded material, and even off-gassing of any water vapor trapped inside. For other materials, it may not be directly noticeable and leave you to believe that everything's okay. It won't be until after you begin printing that you'll see a direct effect. Delamination of printed layers will be one of the most detrimental issues you'll experience. For filament and FFF, manufacturers will supply vacuum-sealed packages to avoid moisture, but it's still up to the operator to make sure that the material is dry before processing. In this case, the operator will need to pay attention to the spool and what type of material it's made out of. Each polymer will have a particular drying procedure, and you will want to make sure that the material used as the actual spool can take the temperature required to dry the spooled filament. For pellets, the manufacturer will supply a user with various sizes of vacuum sealed bags, and again, like the filament, it's up to the operator to dry the material before printing. So what technology should you use? Well, here's some things to consider if you currently own the technology or are looking to bring it in-house. The first thing to determine before even selecting a process is what material you're going to need for the part or for the application at hand. If the part is for prototyping, then match a material for either fit, form, or function, or all together. If the part is for tooling, final part production, then you're going to utilize a material best needed for the application or match a material that's already being used in the industry today. The material choice can be the first step in determining the right technology. As it was explained earlier in the webinar, there's a range of thermoplastic material in filament form, but not everything is readily available. Once material is selected, you might be in a situation where FGF is the only technology available due to the material you've selected, but it doesn't suit the part design. You may need to redetermine your material requirements and see if there's an available filament that can work. If not, material extrusion technology in general just might not be best. If you're in the situation that both technologies can use the material you selected, then you move on to the part at hand and review it with some design considerations. For FFF, you're going to look to see if the part is small to medium, has thin walls, small features, small holes. Again, with a smaller nozzle diameter, the smaller bead width, and the smaller layer height, FFF technology will allow you to print thin-walled, highly complex parts. But as you grow in size, the time in printing may be of concern and may lead you down the path of FGF. For FGF, you'll look to see if the part is medium to large, has thick walls, low complexity, and no overhangs, or doesn't require support material. Now keep in mind, parts produced from FGF technology can be put onto traditional subtractive equipment and be milled to final part design. This is called near net shape printing. You will enlarge your part design, print it fast, and then machine it down to the final dimension. With FGF technology starting with a cheaper material option, and the speed to print is upwards of 200 times faster than FFF, Having additional machining costs to your production is very minimal. This can also help you achieve higher production tolerances. Let's review some critical processing variables. Before printing an actual part, there are a couple critical variables that need to be established, some that were already talked about in this webinar. Nozzle diameter, bead width, layer height, temperatures, and speed. These are variables that will dictate flow rate and your throughput, strength of your part, and even the quality. Most slicing software packages will let you review the toolpath in a simulation format after you determine these variables. 
The operator will look for any problems throughout each layer, making sure the features can be produced and ensure efficient printing. We're going to start with bead width and layer height. An accurate bead width and layer height is what's most important for dimensional accuracy. The machines we develop incorporate robust industrial gantry systems that demonstrate excellent precision and repeatability. What will really dictate the part dimensions and tolerance is how accurate the operator can dial into the critical variables already listed. With the open source machines and materials, one of the most common problems with achieving tight tolerances is not matching up the proper bead width and layer height to the wall thickness and the height of the part. It's important to make sure your bead width is smaller than the minimum wall thickness of your part. and It will be considered optimized if you can make sure that the bead width is an even divisible number of your wall thickness. If you attempt to print with a 1 mm nozzle and your minimum wall thickness is 0.4, smaller than your nozzle diameter, you run the risk of the toolpath missing this section completely as the machine is printing. The software available today is not intelligent enough to alert the operator of this mistake. The operator should be able to catch this during the simulation, but you may end up overlooking and getting a first-hand experience during the printing operation. You can attempt to print beads smaller than your nozzle, but what you're actually doing is under extruding, and it won't be consistent enough to hold any particular tolerances. This goes the same for selecting the printing layer height. The layer height or resolution is a fixed variable. The printer will move in two dimensions, left to right, front to back, and then it's gonna index one layer at a time up and down. The layer height will be first derived from the nozzle diameter selected. A good start would be using 60 to 80% of the diameter. If you have a one millimeter nozzle, start somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8 millimeters. Then you have to make sure that the layer height is an even divisible number of the total height of the part. Next, we're going to talk about the flow rate. So this is the flow of the material through the extruder. And so after you've selected your nozzle diameter, you know what your bead width is, you know what your layer height is. You want to establish the flow rate because it's going to ensure the accurate part dimensions. The trick in this is to achieve a steady, consistent rate of material flow, where the material is at a temperature that melts and bonds well to the previous layers, but also rigid enough to hold itself up throughout the duration of the print. The RPMs, the speed of the screw or rollers, need to be matched with the speed of the gantry, the system that's moving left to right, front to back, so that you can achieve the desired bead width that you planned. The procedures for FFF and FGF are similar as they are both processes of extruding thermoplastics. Other than the mechanics, the only real difference is the scaling of it. The manufacturers of the filament or pellet material help you out by providing a range of temperatures to start with. It's virtually impossible for them to provide it an exact temperature to use since each 3D printer manufacturer uses different equipment and temperature sensors that can provide different readings. To avoid degrading any material, it's always smart to start at the lower end of the range. While testing temperatures out, you'll be looking for a constant flow showing a very consistent diameter. If there's any interruption of that flow, you'll want to take a look at the feeding mechanisms. And if everything looks okay, then you can increase the temperature to reduce the high pressures in the extruder. If the material looks to thin out after extruding, or if the material drools out of the nozzle, you may be too hot and want to cool it down. After feeling comfortable with the extrusion flow, selecting the gantry speeds will finally determine the accuracy of your bead width. If you select a speed that's too high for the RPMs of the extruder, the bead will thin out and be smaller than you planned. This is called under extruding. Then the opposite. If the speed of the gantry is too low for the extruder, then the bead will enlarge. This is called over extrusion. Lastly, we have to remember that carbonizing or degrading of the thermoplastic material can occur. You have to be careful not to improperly heat the material or let the material sit at a temperature for too long of a duration. In FFF, due to the small heating section, you're less likely to degrade this material, and if you do, you're only degrading a small portion of it. The outcome will be small as you may need to change out a new nozzle or even change out the whole extruder. 30 minutes and $200 later, you're good to go. For FGF, it's very easy to degrade the material. The outcome is much worse, could result in thousands of dollars in repairs, and the machine is being down for a day. Finding the balance is key to material extrusion, and what truly makes a difference between a good operator and a great one. Next, we will discuss specimen preparation for filament and pellet printing, along with material properties of each technology as compared to injection molding. Preparation of tensile bars were done by printing them in two orientations. Hexagonal shapes were printed from which test bars were milled from each face of the hexagon. This gives an indication of the inner layer adhesion or z-axis strength since the pulled direction is perpendicular to the print direction. On-edge samples were also printed which consist of printing rectangular samples from which test bars were milled. 
This gives an indication of the strength of the filaments in the print direction since you are pulling along the filament length. In this slide, we show some of our test results at room temperature for Novamid ID 1030 carbon fiber filament. Print trials were performed with various bead widths or extrusion widths while keeping the layer height constant. The properties of the on-edge specimens show higher properties than those printed upright, with modulus values between three to three and a half times greater and tensile stress being two to three and a half times higher. A key observation shown in the graphs is that the stress values from the on-edge specimens are very similar even as the extrusion width changes, with maximum stress varying only 5.4 megapascals and strain remaining virtually unchanged. The stress values from upright specimens show a change as the extrusion width varies with a deviation of 26 megapascals and strain values decreasing 50%. Focusing on the graph to the left, at a high level, the differences observed in the on-edge versus upright specimens are explained by two phenomena. The first is that the fiber orientation in the on-edge specimens is much greater since the filament layers are in direct alignment with the pull direction, while upright specimens are being pulled perpendicular to the direction of the filament layers. Any microvoids present between layers could also provide an area of weakness, especially in the upright specimen since the stress is being directly applied to the area between layers. Switching now to the graph on the right, as previously noted, there was a change in stress values of the upright specimens as the extrusion width changed. These results are related to the amount of energy involved to fuse the layers together. Wider beads correspond to the presence of a higher level of energy, which result in better bonding and thus higher stress values. A high level of focus has been placed in trying to generate properties comparable to traditional manufacturing processes. We have two thermoplastic copolyester products in filament form, and work has been done with these grades to show a comparison to injection molding properties. This graph shows results from tensile strength testing of bars printed in four orientations of our standard thermoplastic copolyester filament and a comparison to injection molded bars of a similar grade. We are continuing to do work in this area to improve this correlation of properties to injection molding. Arnatel ID 2060HT is designed to have higher thermal performance and mechanical properties have been tested after heat aging up to 190 Celsius. This graph shows the change in modulus during heat aging at 175 Celsius for 1000 hours as compared to a similar injection molding grade. A nice correlation of performance is observed across most of the heat age duration. Now discussing some of the work that has been done with pellet printing, tensile specimens were prepared by first printing four-sided cubes and then machining tensile specimens using the layout shown in the figure. The layer thickness can vary depending on what the goal of the testing is, and the size of the cube can be altered depending on the number of samples needed. Stress-strain data was generated from bars milled from the X and Z axis as shown in the previous slide. The data is corrected for the cross-sectional area. Vastly different results are noted in the stress-strain behavior in these two axes with the results of the bars machined in the print direction showing significantly higher maximum stress values. When overlaying stress-strain data of a comparable injection molding grade, a very nice correlation is observed. Slightly higher properties are observed with 3D printed bars, which is most likely due to better overall alignment of fibers in the printed beads versus the alignment of fibers that is achieved in the injection molded bars. A high level summary of what was reviewed today is as follows. The first item is that an understanding of material handling requirements, especially drying, of the respective material you are printing is critical to your success. Secondly, there are various advantages of FFF and FGF you should consider when selecting which technology to utilize for your application. Third, after you have determined which technology you will utilize, the most critical print process parameters you should optimize to obtain the best appearance and strength of the part you are printing are bead width, layer height, and flow rate. When evaluating mechanical performance of the material you are using, you should be aware of the print direction in respect to the part orientation. When keeping other parameters constant, the extrusion width is noted to have a direct impact on mechanical performance. Lastly, the performance of 3D printing technologies are often compared to traditional processes such as injection molding. You should consider all the factors in the print technology you are using in comparison to the actual behavior of the part in your application when evaluating performance. Thank you.